Uh, we canceled lecture six. Uh, I had a doctor's appointment for my my hip injury, and uh, so they they said my my hip is okay, but they recommend a brain transplant. So I'm gonna. It's a little joke, a little physics joke. Anyway, so uh, but you know we're 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 really far ahead of the schedule. Uh, be, you know why? Because I think first of all, you guys are smart, and also it's a fairly smallish class, so there's not a whole lot of uh, blooping and scooping. But uh, we're doing good. Uh, we have an exam next Tuesday, a week from today. All right, and so that's going to be your first exam. And remember, uh, the way that we do exams, there's no makeup exams. All right, so you you definitely want to be here if you possibly can. Now, if you're in the emergency room, see if the nurse will you know wheel you in on a wheelchair uh, or something like that. But short of that, uh, try to get here. Uh, but if you know if you are uh, uh, you know in the hospital, I mean we I had an exam with my other class yesterday, and there's a guy in the hospital, so. Um, it becomes your dropped exam, but then you're obligated to take the next two midterms. So remember, we take the best two out of three. If you're absent for one, that's your dropped exam, excused or unexcused. Um, we'll talk more about the exam on Thursday, I guess. Uh, we have uh, stuff to talk about today in Chapter 3 of the textbook, if, you, if you're following in the textbook. Uh, but before we do that, let me just reinforce, uh, we have SI today at 2.30 to 3.20 over in the Teaching Academy. And then tomorrow we have uh, 3 to 3.50, Business Admin 1, Room 126. Also tomorrow, um, we have office hours with me. If you So if you can't make it to SI on Wednesday, but you can make it to my office hours. That's great. Okay. And the rule for office hours is you have the agenda. So you bring a question or a topic that you want to go over and then, excuse me, I just drank a monster. So I'm burping a little bit. I don't want to burp into the YouTube. Uh, so you, you bring a question or a topic to discuss, and then that's what we'll talk about. And if there's more than one person, then we'll, we'll just go around the room and everybody gets to ask a question, then we go back around again, stuff like that. So it works out pretty good. Now, um, Jasmine just told me a few minutes ago that Thursday this week is going to be her uh, exam one review. Okay, so that's right after lecture, 12... 30 and she's extending it to 150 so it's an extra 30 minutes uh, 1230 to 150 p.m. over uh, down the street here in Nelson or Nicholson School of Communication so uh, be there or be square and try to get to the SI if you can and even if you can only make it to the last 20 minutes that's going to help you all right uh, I highly recommend it or the first 20 minutes or, you know, some segment of 15 minutes or, or so. That's all you can spare out of your schedule. Just go. It'll it'll definitely help you. All right. Uh, any other questions about SI and so forth? OK, let's keep going. Um, I want to review an item with you from homework two. Have your clicker out because I'm going to follow up the clicker the homework two question about these velocity graphs. Remember that one? The question was uh, which one it is possibly a free fall um, velocity graph, but not on Earth, but on another planet with weaker gravity. And that has to be this one here, uh, graph K, because you, if you look at the numbers, you can see that the, uh, 
the acceleration, it's negatory acceleration, it's downward acceleration, because it's slanting down to the right. So that's negative. Rise over run is negative. The rise over run, if you actually calculate it out, it's minus 2 meters per second squared. So that's a little bit weaker than Earth, a little bit stronger than the moon, you know, and I'm sure there's a planet around or a moon somewhere in the solar system or maybe in a nearby solar system with a, a surface gravity of minus 2 meters per second squared. All right, so that's the other planet. Now, um, have your clickers out and... Let's do some clicking together, and hopefully going through these clicker questions, Deanna, it's going to help you on the exam because um, if I, you know what I sometimes do is give you a bunch of velocity graphs on the cover, cover page. By the way, just so you know, the, the structure of my exams is there's a cover page where it says uh, exam form A, B, C, or D, and then there's some information printed out for free. You know, like I'll give you G, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and, you know, maybe a few other constants and stuff. And it'll change. You know, exam three, it'll look a little bit different. And sometimes I put diagrams on the front, big diagrams that I don't want to put in the regular part of the test. Okay. And so I'll say, you know, like on question number 11, I might say, refer to the diagram on of the velocity graphs on the cover page, all right? So I might give you a set of two or three questions on velocity graphs, like the ones you're about to see. So here we go. Uh, question number one. Which graph could represent you dropping a water balloon from the top of the library? Also, as I mentioned last time, the formulas that you need will, for the exam, they won't be extensive what you need, but you'll have three or four matching items to start the exam, uh, you know, five or six matching items with uh, questions, um, with the formula and a concept or the name of the formula or something for you to match up. 10 seconds to vote, starting now. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, let's see what you guys voted for. Uh-oh. We got some splaining to do. Look at that. There's a little bit of controversy between uh, S and U. Let me bring this back over here. Uh, the answer is S, which is answer B. Um, and I see some of you just changed your answer to that. Good. All right, that's clever. I forgot to stop the question. Um, yeah, so here's, the, so here's the reasoning for that. If you got tripped up with graph U, here's why. Um, If you drop something from the top of the library, it starts at rest, and then it acquires downward speed. This one starts at rest. The other ones don't, okay? And so that's your tip off there. It's got a nice negative acceleration, and it starts at 0.0, .0 meters per second. So, in other words, it starts at rest. All right, now I'm going to give you another question. And I want you to hit the refresh key on your calculator or on your unit. And this one, it's possible to type in more than, or it's possible that more than one answer is correct. Now, all I want you to do is hit one answer and then hit the send key. All right. Uh, yeah. You're like, this is, this is the fourth week of classes. You're, you're behind the times here. Okay. So what you do is you hold the power button down until the rectangle flashes in the upper left. Then you type in DD. Okay. Do you have go nitro? Okay, good. So you're ready to roll. So you get, so you missed the first question, but you can get this one. All right. So this is short answer. Here we go. Um, and so you can 
but but what you want to do is type in your letter a b c d or e and uh and then hit the send key okay so this one's we're focusing on graph u what does that represent how would you describe that object and you might feel like I want you to choose the one that you like best okay you may think the two of them are righteous I want you to type in the one that you think is best Okay, uh, 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Now make sure to hit the send key, and then, then we'll, we'll be good. Now here are the results over here, and you can see that a lot of people chose A. Uh-oh, some people chose A. Now, I wanted one letter. If you voted for A, E, or A, D, change it to either A or E or A or D. I only want one. It's still open. Go ahead and change it. Give me A, give me D, or give me E. Good. All right. Who voted for A, D? All right. Change that to A or D, please. Okay, good. Now, um, so here's what we got. We got a lot of A's. Uh, we've got some B's, C's, D's, and E's. Um, all right. And guess what? Rise time is one second. Uh, and that's because it starts with 9.8 meters per second of upward speed. All right. And in the first second, it's down to zero. See, that's what this says down here. V of one second is 0, 0.0 meters per second. That's right here. It stopped. It's no longer going upward. That's the rise time. Another correct. So, so here's what you got to look for right there. There's your, there's your reason for uh, option C being correct. And guess what? Option C uh, was not one of the popular options on this one. Here's another one. It's moving upward for one second. Yeah, that's true. Because this is upward motion. Um, let's see if I can get it. Okay, those two up there are out. Um, that velocity, that distance triangle there, the first one, it's above the time axis, so it's moving upward. All right, so that's upward motion, you know, some, some number of meters. And then this one down here, um, I didn't, you, it's kind of hard to see. I didn't draw on a triangle for it, but you could. And that one, and actually I'm a little bit off there with my arrow. That should be inside the uh, other velocity, the other distance triangle. Anyways, that lower one is downward motion. So, yeah, uh, upward for one second, it stops at one second, and then it starts going downward for uh, one second. Question. Repeat. Repeat. It's a velocity graph. Don't think of this as a track in XY graph paper. Remember, velocity graphs are abstract. You have to interpret them to know. You know, your instinct is to draw something out on, you know, graph paper. Right? And that's kind of what you're thinking. Which you can do but not directly from this. You have to interpret this, okay? You know, you know, some upward motion, and then it's zero. That's the turning point, and then downward motion, and and then you put together an X Y. Right, because those are positive. Up here above the timeline is positive speeds. 
that's what this graph shows you. It's a velocity graph. It's one dimensional, so it doesn't tell anything about VX horizontal. You know, we could use another graph for that. This one only tells you about the VY, the, the Y component of, this, of the velocity. But what it tells you is that up here, you're going upward down here, negative, you're going downward. And the acceleration also is down and to the right. The acceleration is down and to the right for all these. So it, it marks some kind of a downward acceleration, whether it's gravity or another planet or something like that. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. It, it represents some either tossed straight up and then coming straight back down or possibly, you know, a, a baseball hit to the outfield. And this is only the Y component. We don't know anything about the horizontal component of the motion. If that was positive, if it was positive, you know, going to the right like this, okay, and there's no such thing as horizontal gravity, so it would stay, you know, whatever it starts with, you know, 10 meters per second or something, and just keep 10 meters per second horizontal. That would be a boring velocity graph. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it could be either a pop-up straight up and down or something heading out to the outfield and then back down. So for a se total hang time of two seconds. So, um, and then this one down here, uh, it's acceleration is negative downward, and that's actually true, uh, but its velocity is not always downward. Uh, so I crossed out the word always on that one because up here, uh, in the first half of the graph, the velocity is upward. Okay, so you, as I said, you have to interpret an abstract graph like this in order to think in two-dimensional graph paper or you know, three-dimensional space. All right. Now, um, let me just re, uh, reinforce that on exam one coming up next Tuesday, I might give you a bunch of questions just like this. I might even give you these last three. All right. Verbatim. All right. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Now, I want to go back to the three laws of motion uh, for from Sir Isaac Newton. And we talked about the first law uh, and the second law last time, lecture five. Question? The question is, are the tests going to be similar to homework questions? Uh, no. The tests are much bigger than homework assignments. Um, it's going to be 50 points. So if I make it all multiple choice, it's going to be 50 multiple choice questions, whereas homework is maybe about eight or nine and maybe a calculation. But Could be. I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell you what's going to be on the exam. But having done homework, usually students that do the homework are happy when they get to the exam, because as I as I've mentioned before, the things that the things that I have to decide every day for every assignment is what's important so important that I, I need to talk about it during lecture. What's well, so important, I need to have a homework question about it. And if you think about it, that's also what an exam is about. And in the exam, I'm trying to see if you savvy what I think is important. All right, so if, you, if it shows up in lecture, shows up in homework, shows up in clicker questions, that gives you an indication that I think it's at least passing importance you know, if not ultimate importance. So, all right. Uh, question. You can, if you have an attempt on the homework, you can always go back and look at it. So if you don't have an attempt on it, you have to look at a classmates. But, all right, let's talk about mass. Mass is completely different from a distance or a time measurement. Uh, the mass of an object is its actually kind of mysterious. Um, time and, and distance measurements are geometric, but mass is not really – there's no straight edge 
that we can mark off in little increments for mass. But the way that we do a mass measurement is, uh, is um, let me get my clicker out here. Hold on a second. Um, we measure the mass of something uh, here we go um, in a scale now what the mass tells you is it's it's a measure of how inert something is to changes in its velocity state so if you have a lot of mass, it's going to be hard to get your, you know what, moving, right? But if you have a small amount of mass, it's relatively easy to get going, all right? And so that's what mass encodes. Um, you know, the, the resistance to the change in your dynamical state. Now, in the metric system, we use kilograms, all right, and grams. Now, a gra and gram is actually the the base unit. The gram is equal to the amount of mass in a single cubic centimeter of liquid H2O. You know, at such and such an atmospheric pressure and temperature in Paris, France. You know, the metric system was designed over there in France. You know, back, I don't know, 1700s, I guess. Uh, late 1700s, eight, early 1800s. And they said, you know, well, let's define the mass in terms of such and such amount of water because water is so common, right? So that's what they did. Um, the way that you figure out how many grams your object is, you basically you put it in a balance and then try to balance it with some countable number of uh, cubic centimeters of water. So like, so for instance, this, um, this bottle of water, this is a liter bottle of water, all right? So that means a thousand cc's thousand cubic centimeters that's a liter and therefore a thousand grams that's one kilogram now if something balances with that then you know that you know so in other words if the if the if the balance goes like this and just bounces out flat you know nice and nice and even then you've got one uh, kilogram on the other side now if you've got a, a basketball over there basketball is a little bit less than a kilogram, all right? So, uh, so the kilogram is going to weigh down the, the scale and defeat the uh, the basketball. So what you do is you you change the number of cc's, okay? So you you know you siphon out you know like 10 cc's of water and try it again, and you siphon out 10 more cc's of water, try it again, and so eventually you get some kind of a count of the number of cc's of water where it balances the object that you're talking about and then that number of cc's of water remaining uh, is equal to the number of grams in your object and as i recall <coughs> a basket a regulation nba basketball is about 620 grams 0 0.62 kilograms it's actually kind of heavy it's made of leather and stuff so for instance in this one you know you can in this diagram you can say all right my liter bottle of water overbalances my basketball uh so i better take out some some water out of my liter bottle of water and eventually you'll get you'll take out or add back and take back take out and add back till they just perfectly balanced and then you say all right that's that's the number of grams in my object whatever it happens to be now another thing i want to mention about newton's second law is the directionality so the directionality of the force um, is the same direction as the acceleration now the way that we express that in an equation is this way we put a little arrow over the net force symbol all right, and that's zero if all your forces bounce, but it's non-zero and has a direction 
if at least one of your forces doesn't perfectly balance out. So if you have 10 newtons to the left and 11 newtons to the right, then you have one net newton to the right, okay? On the other side is the MA, mass times acceleration. Now the mass is a number, basically. Number of grams, number of cc's of water in the balance. So the mass is not a vector, but the acceleration is. You know, for instance, free fall acceleration has a direction downward and it has a magnitude, 9.8 meters per second square. So that means it can be expressed as an arrow, as a vector. So the direction of the net force is um, deducible from the area, from the direction of the acceleration that you measure. So the acceleration you measure with, you know, meter sticks and timers and stuff like that, you know, and, and maybe uh, protractors to get an angle, you know, some direction. And then the mass you measure using a scale, okay? And so the mass doesn't change the direction of the net force, okay? The directionality is all in the acceleration. Now, the, the force, um, the applied net force can accelerate your object in three different ways, okay? It can speed it up. It can slow it down or it can change the direction without speeding it up or slowing it down. Now we're going to talk about that last one, the change of direction or centripetal acceleration in a few minutes. Now, here's a diagram uh, of a Ferrari driving forward, and I've given it a blue velocity arrow. And also over here, um, I've got a little yellow projectile uh, that's aimed right at it, 45 degrees uh, from sternward uh, and port side. And so it's going to give it a little bit of a sideways bump and a little bit of a forward bump. All right, it's coming in at 45. So it's got some, some bumpness to the to the starboard, and it's got some bumpness forward, all right? So in this particular case, you're going to get some speed change because you get a little bit of a bump forward parallel to the uh, velocity, and that makes the arrow longer. So your blue velocity uh, vector here would change after it gets bumped, you know, by a little bit. Maybe a lot. Depend on, depends on how fast that yellow projectile is going. All right. And the other thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a direction change because there's some bump perpendicular to the velocity. Now, if you think about it, um, if you get if you have a velocity like this guy going forward and you have some net force forward, then it's going to get faster. That's parallel to the velocity. Now, uh, go ahead and make a note. There's a, a fancy geometric term that we use in physics called anti-parallel. And anti-parallel means opposite direction. Okay, so there, anti-parallel means, okay, uh, toward the stern, aft, dead aft. Now, we don't have any dead aft here. But if we did, then it would slow down the uh, Ferrari, and the blue arrow would get a little bit smaller. Right? But this diagram here, we just have some forward bump. Um, we have some, um, and that's going to make the blue arrow longer. Now it, we've got some stuff coming in. We've got a little bit of a bump because it's going to it's going to dent in the side of the Ferrari. So anytime you dent something in the side. Um, that means that you've got some force perpendicular to the velocity, all right? And that's going to change the direction. So it's going to veer a little bit off to the uh, starboard, you know, by, you know, have, you know, some number of degrees. It's a pretty small object, so maybe just one degree, but you can measure it. 
All right. And so these, so the basic idea here is you measure the acceleration and its direction and its size. And then that tells you where the, the force is. Um, and an acceleration can either speed it up, slow it down, or change the direction. All right. Now here's some guys trying to accelerate um, out of a curve uh, on the track. I guess they're running the 400. Um, Usain Bolt, what a that guy is amazing. And he's put if if you look at his foot, look at his left foot. His left foot is pushing down into the track. He's trying to raise your hand if you ever if you ran sprints in, on track team in high school. Okay. Uh, do you recall your coach ever telling you to throw the track behind you? Okay, that's what they tell sprinters. To, with their foot, you want to throw the track behind you. That's what Usain Bolt's doing, among other things. Okay. And so he's pushing backwards and downward, all right? And the third law says that the track is pushed, therefore pushing upward on him and forward. And that is how he gets down the track. It's the track that's pushing him forward. He's bringing that out by the way that he, um, you know, by the way he pushes with his feet. And by the way he leans and stuff. Supposedly, his greatest advantage is his height. Um, you know, he just has a, a big forward lean, and he, and he gets a lot of assist from gravity, and that propels him forward with his running motion. Now, I'd like to have two skateboarders come down to the front for a demonstration. Who's got a skateboard today? No, you've already done it once. Okay, who has a skateboard? Come on down. Anybody else with a skateboard? Nope, only one person with a All right, come on down. All right. Now I want you to uh, mount up here in front, aiming towards this direction, okay? And I want you to go toe to toe with this guy and aiming nope not alongside him i want you to go toe to toe like right in front of him mhm mm okay so stand 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 up and get as close as you can together okay good all right now what you're going to do you're going to do patty cakes okay don't do anything yet and when i say go I want you to just push off of each other, okay? And you're going to go one way, and you're going to go the other way, okay? And what's your first name again? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And you're Kelsey, Kelsey. okay. So Kelsey and Jeremiah are going to do this demonstration. Um, when I say go, one, two, three, go! <laughs> Yay. All right. Now, uh, Jeremiah, you were pushing this way, right? How come you went that way? The wheels pushed him back. She's the one. Uh, Kelsey's the one that pushed Jeremiah. Jeremiah's the one that pushed Kelsey. Uh, all right, switch positions. Let's see if it goes left to right the same way it does right to left. All right, and this time I'll get really close, as close as you can. <laughs> Okay, and I want you to really give a good stout push. One, two, three, go! And look how far Kelsey goes. And Jeremiah did a good job over here, but Kelsey's way over there. All right, so something's different. Kelsey's got a, a smaller mass number than Jeremiah. Jeremiah's a little bit bigger, a few more kilograms than Kelsey. Okay, thanks, you guys. Now, the, the two skateboarder demonstration brings out Newton's third law really well because what they're doing is they're doing an equal but opposite reaction. You know, this, uh, Sir Isaac Newton's third law says for every 
uh, action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. All right, that's this famous phrase. But, you know, Kelsey was blazing over here to the right. That didn't look equal, you know. But there were some things about what they were doing that, um, that definitely were equal. In this diagram, it shows you that the push force, in this case between an astronaut and a spacecraft, uh, the push force is the same. So Jeremiah and Kels Chelsea, it's Kelsey, right? Yeah. Okay. Kelsey and Jeremiah, uh, they each pushed with a certain number of newtons of force. You know, the last example, Kelsey was pushing to the left and Jeremiah was pushing to the right. But, you know, like they were both pushing with 150 newtons of force. You know, so one was... You know, so Jeremiah was positive 150 and Kelsey was negative 150. And that's one of the things that is equal in this uh, situation. With And those two forces, uh, they're known as third law pairs. Okay. And engineers and physicists think about the third law all the time. Now, let me ask you this. And this is kind of a mental IQ test question. Um, Kelsey and Jeremiah pushing off from each other. Kelsey was really, especially on the second trial, when they gave a really good push, uh, Kelsey went flying way over here. So does that mean that Kelsey was in contact longer than Jeremiah was? Was, they have a contact time. So was Kelsey's contact time longer than what Jeremiah's? I see somebody in the back there. You're you're not you're, you're going like this. Why do you say? Yeah, no, don't look back there. You. Yeah. Why are you shaking your head? Yeah, it's like it's contact. So contact time. You know, if you, if Kelsey breaks contact. That means Jeremiah breaks contact. So the so the interaction time, I like to call it the interaction time or contact time, delta T, is the same for both. All right. Now, let's do another look at the skateboarders' distances and times and stuff. And this is actually from uh, the textbook, Chapter 3, and uh, the example of the two skateboarders in the book. Um, so let's go ahead and write down some specs here. Two skateboarders, Carl, uh, who has a mass of 40 kilograms and an initial speed of 0, 0.0. Okay, so that's like one of the skateboarders up here. They both started at rest. V subscript I equals 0. 0.00 meters per second. The second skateboarder is named Bob. Okay, and Bob has a double the mass. So these two guys have different masses, just like Kelsey and Jeremiah do. Uh, although we don't know their, their mass numbers. They're definitely different. And uh, let's say that Bob starts at the same uh, rest, state of rest. So they're toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and then they push off from each other. All right, so here's the interaction specs. The interaction force is 500 newtons. Let's just say that that's the number of newtons that they're able to push with, all right? So they've been doing their workouts over at the gym. They've been doing their bench press, and they're putting up 500 newtons. So that's about, that's you know what that's like? That's like lifting, uh, That's like lifting 50 kilograms. So that's about 100 pounds. So definitely they can do this. All right. So there's your interaction force. And we're, I'm just making that up. Let's just say, for instance, that, you know, for a nice round number for the sake of conversation. So let's say that Bob on Carl, he pushes off to the right with 500 newtons. And then Carl on Bob, C on B, pushes leftward with 500. So he gets a minus 500 newtons. All right? But the magnitudes are the same. So Sir Isaac Newton says equal but opposite. 
Okay, so 500 and 500, but one of them's negatory, right? Opposite direction, all right? Now, let's say that they have a contact time of 0 0.48 seconds. Now, we already know, I couldn't trick you guys. Um, you know that the contact time is the same for both of them, okay? So that means that... Um, we can figure out a whole lot of different things. Now, F equals MA, right? So we can figure out acceleration. You know, 500 newtons of force, plus or minus, and then either 40 kilograms or 80 kilograms. That's easy. So we just divide 500 by 40. Um, and for Carl, there it is, 500 newtons to the right, Divided by his mass, and that's his acceleration. That's A equals F over M. And that's 12.5 meters per second squared. Now, we also know that the interaction time, the amount of time, uh, Daniel, that he's accelerating is 0 0.48 seconds. And we're going to use that in a second here. Now, but first, let's get uh, Bob's um, acceleration. Here's Bob. All right. Same thing, except he's going to the left. So minus 500 newtons, and divide by his mass. Now, he's got a bigger mass, 80 kilograms. All right, good round number. So his acceleration is negative 6.25 meter per second squared. And guess who's got the bigger acceleration? The person with the smaller mass. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. That's like Kelsey getting blazed over to the right. All right, she got really accelerated. And Jeremiah got a little bit of oomph over here to the to the uh, left, but not nearly as much as Kelsey. Kelsey, question. The minus 500 with – one of them's going to the left, and I'm just saying, you know, that Bob's getting a, a leftward force, okay? So leftward – in this context, we're um, left and right. Rightward is positive numbers, and leftward is negatory numbers. Okay, so um, so if you look at the interaction force, 3A, uh, the force of Bob on Carl, so Bob is pushing this way on Carl. So Carl gets accelerated the, in this direction, to the right. And then FC on B, that's F of Carl on Bob. So Bob gets 500 newtons this way, all right? And I've just made a choice, you know, as to which guy goes where, okay? Uh, all right, so let's figure out delta V now. Uh, delta V, A delta T, we've got the A's. We know what delta T is. Let's just work it out. All right, Carl's delta V, 12.5 uh, meters per second squared positive times good old 0 0.48 seconds so that's the amount of time that he's accelerating and it gets him 6.0 meters per second of speed in this direction to the right now let's see what bob gets bob's got um, a smaller acceleration and the same contact time so come on Oh, my clicker turned off. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Bob, delta V. Now he's got leftward zero points, or excuse me, uh, negative six point two five meters per second square. Uh, so not as much acceleration. So this is like Jeremiah getting getting blooped over to the to the to the left. He did all right, but he didn't get blazed. Uh, Kelsey got blazed over here to the right. Okay, same as Bob's getting blooped over here to the left. Uh, negative 3.0 meters per second squared, or negative 3.0 meters per second of speed. So that's the speed he develops after 0 0.48 seconds of contact. All right, so they're doing patty cake for 0.48 seconds. And that's a little bit long. I don't think they were... If, if we could time their contact time, it'd probably be more, be more like a tenth of a second. But, you know, let's let the numbers do the talking. 
All right, so the final velocity states, they started at zero. So uh, Carl's final velocity, 6.0 meters per second. Bob's uh, final velocity, V subscript F, negative 3.00 meters per second. All right. And let me just point out to you that in all of this, some things are equal, other things are not. So you have to be careful of what you're talking about. The forces of interaction are equal in size, opposite in direction. The contact times are equal in size, equal in duration. But the final velocities are not. The masses are not. And so you have to be able to, um, you know, distinguish that when you're when you're trying to do all this stuff. So, so here's the things over here uh, that are um, are equal. The 500 Newton interaction force, you know, plus or minus 500, and then the contact time. Question. It's, that's what Sir Isaac Newton, that's, it's, it, it's his law. And he, he was saying that it's, it's the structure of the universe that the pushes are going to be the same size. And, you know, galaxies, you know, planets, you know, Earth interacting with moon, you know, the forces are the same size. But, you know, the moon is much smaller. So we see the moon change its velocity state. It's in orbit around us. But it's exerting the same number of newtons on the Earth as the Earth exerts on it. But it's opposite direction, and the Earth is so much more mass that you, you don't really see the, the Earth. You know, the Earth doesn't orbit the moon. It's mainly just the – it's more like the Earth is in place and gets maybe budged a little bit, but the moon does most of but, you know, there are stars, binary star systems out in the universe all over the place where you have uh, two stars that, you know, like one of them's, you know, 50 percent the mass of the sun. The other one's about 60 percent the mass of the sun or two times the mass of the sun and 2.1 times the mass of the sun. And so they have very close masses and you'll see them orbiting each other. If they both went to the wall and then, and then pushed, the wall has effectively got infinite mass because you can't move it. Okay. But it's rigid, so it's pushing back. You couldn't use a wall made of water because the water wouldn't be able to push back unless it was frozen water. But liquid water, no, you couldn't do it. All right. You know, a surfer is basically trying to slide down um, and, you know, stay on top of a, of a vertical surface of water, right, liquid water. But he's got to have a buoyant surfboard to do it. You know, he can't just stand on it. Right. Let's keep going. All right, back to multiple choice. Hit your refresh key. And let me change this type to multiple choice. And let's go. And here, you know, what is this product? Go ahead and calculate it out. 500 newtons times 0 0.48 seconds. What does that equal to? Good. Okay, 20 seconds starting now. It's 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, we have a lot of spread in this question, and uh, but the correct answer uh, is 240 newton seconds. Now, uh, let me see if I can. Um, in this, you, you just multiply 4, 0.48 times 500. That gives you 240. And then newton seconds. And now a newton second is the same as 1.00 kilogram meter per second squared. That's a newton times one second. So the one of the seconds in the denominator cancels the second. So down here, get my cursor over here. We go. This second squared uh, turns into seconds, and this second up here in the numerator uh, goes out of there. So so uh, a newton second is the same uh, as a kilogram meter per second. And guess what that is, you guys. That's the mass times the speed, or mass times the velocity, kilogram, meter per second. And guess what? Those are the two things that are not equal in the skateboard interaction, in the moon-earth interaction. The Andromeda galaxy interacting with the Milky Way galaxy, our home galaxy. Their masses are not equal and their speeds are not equal. But somehow it's tied up with the two things that are, the force and the interaction time. Next question. What would F delta T be equal to? Look at it carefully. Uh oh. <laughs> I accidentally did the wrong. Okay. Oh boy, you guys are geniuses. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so that's that's the answer, M delta V. Sorry about that. The and, and that leads us to this. I, I was trying to rearrange the things on my, my home screen here. Um that leads us to something called the impulse equation, F delta T equals m delta v. Now look at this. The two things that are equal are force and interaction time, delta t. They're multiplied together. The two things that are not equal in themselves, the two masses, the two skateboarder masses, the two planet masses, the two galaxy masses, they're not equal. And neither are the velocities, but the product m times v is equal. And that is where uh, Sir Isaac Newton is taking us. Let me see if I can move the slide here. The impulse equation tells you, oops, oopsie doopsie. Okay. Okay, and and if you if you have the textbook, you can read about that the first few chapters of uh, 4.1. Now I want to finish out chapter three by talking about for the last 20 minutes or so a uniform circular motion. All right, so that's our next topic. Uh, and I like to use the Nardo ring um, as a an example of a huge circle. And the Nardo ring is a test track in the boot heel of Italy. Um, it's perfectly circular. There's the boot heel of Italy, uh, Google Maps there. And the Nardo ring is uh, indicated there. And we'll just kind of focus in 
we get a little closer. There's the overhead view. There's the ring uh, from space. Here it is. Get a little closer. There it is. And here's the overhead of it. Now the Nardo ring is a is a test track. Uh, I believe uh, Fiat, the, the Italian automaker, owns it. Uh, but they let other car companies use it uh, to test their vehicles. Uh, the outermost lane of the Nardo ring is, is banked and sized for 149 miles per hour optimal speed. So now you may think, why are they testing cars at that speed? Well, it's Europe, right? They have autobahns over there. In an autobahn, there's no speed limit. Actually, I take that back. Anybody been over to Europe lately? Do, do the autobahns still have no speed limit? Right, but once you get off the highway. You know, and, and it's just like out in Montana. It used to be in Montana that during the day there was no speed limit. And at, at night you had to drive 65. But then the feds got involved, you know, the Department of Transportation funding, and they made they made Montana, a bunch of other, you know, like Arizona and stuff, Nevada, put in speed limits during the day. So, so in Montana... They said, all right, the speed limit during the day is 70, so you can't drive faster than that. And you know how they got around it? They said, all right, the speed limit is 70, and the cost of a speeding ticket is $5. So compare that to a speeding ticket here, which is like $162. It's bodacious. So anyways, they're doing Autobahn speeds for passenger cars. And if you want to go faster than that, you have to actually – put a little bit of spin on your wheel, your steering wheel. But they have it banked so that at that speed, on that radius, at that banking angle, 149 miles per hour, you don't have to just keep everything straight ahead. It's like running on a straight track. Now, the other uh, innermost lane is for testing trucks. Okay, so that it, this the inner track is not banked as much. Um, and this is more like a U.S. interstate, 50 miles per hour optimal speed. So, so what they do is they they just run these vehicles uh, until the cows come home, circles and circles. You know, they test it for endurance and durability. And uh, they have to have, if you think about it. The Nardo ring cannot operate if it's icy. And it's down there in southern Italy, so they're not going to get a whole lot of ice down there anyways. I imagine they have it once in a while during the winter. But you can't you can't do corners well on an icy road. Now, we hardly ever get any ice down here in Florida on the roads. But like up in Minnesota right now in Chicago... Oh my goodness, they're getting blazed up there. But you, you're if you're on a circular track, you've got to have some grip. The track has got to push you and keep you just like Usain Bolt. It's actually the track that pushes him down towards the finish line. The on the Nardo Ring, the track keeps you on the track and your tires so you can't run on an icy track and you can't run on a on tires made of teflon you know they got to have some kind of grip All right so that's what we're going to talk about today uniform circular motion go ahead and make yourself a circle at one instant of time and i'm parking my object out there that black dot at the three o'clock clock position uh, velocity is counterclockwise uh, and that's at instant of time t1 now instant of time t2 uh, put that at, the object is now up at two o'clock all right and it's still going uh, counterclockwise and uh, and it has the same radius. So we're, we're taking, this is two snapshots. 
So the circular path is the same. So R is the same. It's uniform circular motion. That means the speed is the same. Now, the velocity is not the same. And why is that? Because the direction has changed. Remember, a velocity is a speed and direction combined together. So if you change one, you have an, you know, you, you have an acceleration. So this is an accelerated system, and it's idealized. You know, they, and the, but, you know, we have a real-life version down in Nardo, Italy. All right, now, what we're going to do is I'm going to copy. I want you to look at my slides and then kind of maybe add to your notes. Uh, I'm going to copy the black radius vector from the second circle, the T2 circle, over to the T1 circle. Okay, so and so tail to tail, both of them anchored at the at the center. All right, and I'm going to move that off to the side. So there they are. And right? so I'm going to park that down here. All right. Now that's uh, about 30 degrees. I measured this really carefully. Right, so, so T T1 is at about not at three o'clock. T2 is at two o'clock. It's about 30 degrees. All right, now I'm going to do the same thing with the velocities. So here I'm copying my velocity arrows, and I'm going to park those over here to the side, tail to tail, in red. Now, those two are also 30 degrees apart because if they're perpendicular to the radii, to the two black R's, then they're going to be 30, and, and the radii are 30 degrees apart, then the two red ve velocity vectors are going to be 30 degrees apart. You know, whatever the two radii are apart, 7.3 degrees, then the two velocity vectors are going to be the same degree apart. In this case, it's 30. Now, I'm going to take my two circles and kind of park them over here to the side. All right, so, I get, so there's my two reference circles, two different snapshots, 30 degrees of time. And now over here on the black position triangle, okay, that's my position triangle. Go ahead and Put in the third side. Go ahead and make it a triangle. And then mark it in R and R. Uh, what kind of triangle is that called? Remember the fancy name for it? Yep, isosceles. All right. So go ahead and write down isosceles triangle in your notes somewhere. Now, this dashed line is approximately the distance of travel. Why isn't it exactly the distance of travel? It's because it's curved. The, the actual motion is along the circle. This is a straight line segment. All right. So if, my, if I make my two instances of time a little bit closer together, it'll be even closer to the true distance. All right, now let's go over here to the velocity triangle. Okay, so I have V2 and V1, all right? And those are the same, those are two different vectors, but the same speed. So this is like 50 miles an hour on the inner Nardo ring for testing trucks. Uh, go ahead and complete the third side, make another isosceles, except this was kind of upside down, but it's still an isosceles triangle. All right. Now, you can't say that these two triangles are um, identical, but you can say that because one of them, the, the perimeter, the lengths are in meters, uh, the black triangle, the red triangle, the perimeter and lengths are measured in meters per second. So you can't, you can't mix apples and oranges, but you can say that they're proportional. All right? So um, 
the dashed line on the red velocity triangle is delta V, the difference between the two velocities. Okay, so that's tip to tip. You put the two tails together and you go tip to tip, and that is delta V. In other words, V2 minus V1. All right, so there's your formula for that. And graphically, you just connect tip to tip. Nothing fancy about that. Now, as I mentioned, these two triangles are similar. All right, the angles are equal. The sides are proportional. You can't say that they're congruent because it's mixing apples and oranges, distances and speeds. But you can say that they're proportional. And that proportionality is going to give us the key to the acceleration and the force that you must have on the Nardo ring in order to stay on the Nardo ring and not go over the side and, you know, off into the bushes or something like that. All right, so here we go. So what we're going to do, you know, with proportional triangles, you can make a ratio between uh, the side of one triangle and the side of another triangle, the, the corresponding side of the other triangle. All right. So for us, we can make a ratio between the two dashed sides. The dashed side, the base of the black isosceles triangle, and the red dashed side, the base of the red velocity triangle. So here's where that is. Okay. This term uh, on the right, V delta T, that's this, that's my, um, that's my change of position um, from the position triangle. All right. V delta T. And then on the left side of that proportion up here, this, this baby, let me get my cursor. Okay. Right over here, R and V uh, those are the isosceles sides. So isosceles R of the position triangle divided by isosceles V of the uh, velocity triangle. All right. And this is the proportion that gets us the formulas that we want. Matter of fact, look at that formula as it is right now. Anybody see an acceleration in there? Kind of like a subterfuge, hidden acceleration. What do you see? Yeah, delta V and delta T, except it's upside down, right? All right, so we got it. We got an acceleration in there. The way that I've stacked it, it's delta T over delta V. So that's like the inverse of an acceleration, but it's in there. All right, now. This is the isosceles sides, position and speed, top and bottom. And then over here, this is the isosceles base, um, position and speed, top and bottom. All right. Now, let's flip-flop it and get delta V over delta T. And, hey, let's park that other V. This V up here, over here next to the delta T, Let's, let's cross multiply that to the other side. All right. You think? So here's what we got. All right. So there's delta V over delta T on the left. That's my acceleration. We flip flopped it. And then I, I parked my V. So now I've got V squared in the bottom of this one over here. And, and I flip flop it. So now V squared is in the numerator and R is in the denominator. And my wonderful students, that formula is what we call centripetal acceleration. The centripetal acceleration that your tires and the road surface must deliver. You must not use Teflon tires. You must not have a tire. Uh, you must, must not have a surface of ice they have to give you some acceleration and it depends on the speed that you're in fact the square of the speed so if you have a little bit of speed you're squaring it and then you're really getting a big numerator there and it depends on the radius so if you have a big radius 
that means your big numer uh, your big denominator, your quotient's going to be smaller. And so if you're on a big radius, you don't really need a whole lot of traction. All right? But if you have a lot of speed, yeah, you do. Now, here's a picture. Go ahead and draw yourself another circle. And I've got, I don't know, a tennis ball out there running around on a circular, on the end of a string. The centripetal acceleration, as you'll find in tonight's homework, which will be ready about supper time or so, homework number three, um, that acceleration is, is going to point to the exact center of the circle. The velocity is tangential to the circle. That's the red velocity vector. Okay. The radius right here, that's perpendicular to the circle and connects straight to so the radius and the acceleration uh are along the same direct actually one's inward and the radius is uh usually marked as an outward vector all right so there's your your geometry of or your visual summary of uniform circular motion now to get the acceleration the tires have to provide some grip force. You know, the tires and the road surface, all right? And the track provides this acceleration through the third law. So, it, so here's how it works. You control the speed, you know, with the gas pedal and the brakes. And actually, you control it, too, with the steering wheel, all right, if you want to go a little bit faster than, you know, 149 miles per hour on the outermost ring. And then the distance R, that's in the design of the track, right? So these are all the factors. And so you can, you can calculate the amount of acceleration the tires have to provide on a given track. Now, if it's a banked track, then you got a little bit of trig to do now. We're not going to worry about the trig. But in general, this means that, you know, like for Daytona, they know that they have to have tires that have a certain amount of friction to them on an asphalt or whatever the track surface is out there at Daytona. So let's make a summary here. Because of proportional triangles, the speed triangle and the position triangle, we have acceleration toward the center centripetal do not say centrifugal centrifugal means away from the center fugal f-u-g fugitive flee that means away from the center centripetal means toward the center and here's your centripetal force down here which is just f equals ma you know m times the centripetal uh, acceleration and that's the amount of newtons of force that you've got to deliver to your car. So, you know, the guys at, at um, you know, at Daytona or the Indy 500, you know, any of these racetracks and stuff, they know to a T how well their tires have to grip. Those, you know, those guys spend a lot of time, you know, designing and, and finding tires, you know, the right size and width and stuff because they've got to deliver a certain amount of force, all right? And so, um, so when we talk about centripetal acceleration, centripetal force, this is what we mean. It's a V squared over R for the acceleration and MV squared over R for the force. Now, we're going to apply this to uh, universal gravitation uh, on Thursday. All right, so for tonight, let's dismiss. Uh, homework three will be due Thursday, 10.30 a.m., um, and I'll see you then. You're dismissed. Good class today.